Uh, thank you so much. I was negotiating with Philip to, for, to give you more time. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is very interesting. Um, I would like to ask, because digitization is here, we're going to use it, but how are we going to be able to apply it in these different uh, uh, levels of economic growth that we are facing currently? Ethiopia is completely different from South Africa, South Af Africa from uh, Nigeria, even within this same continent, and Europe and the West are completely different. So what, 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 what ca how can we use this, this technology to improve efficiency and equity to a certain extent? Yolisa uh, 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 has touched it, but how can we even increase it even more? I will give this opportunity to the ladies. Kate and then <laughs> Jacqueline. The, the core thing is that it's really important that people who are, are developing transport in, in African city, cities make sure that they use technology and digital um, activities and don't let digital opportunities use them. Um, so there are lots of new things available. Look at them, look at your own strategy, figure out where they fit in. I don't think that people who are developing transport strategies under severe constraints in complicated cities um, should be pressured into using things that don't fit their needs. I do think that there is a place for digital taxis and various other types of uh, digital and ride sharing issues. By the way, ride sharing is hardly a digital invention. Ride sharing has been going on in Nigeria for probably before, since before I was born. Taxis have been doing it for years. It's a standard mode. There's even a name for it different in different cities. So cities know how, what their options are, and I think that they, they already do a fairly good job of sizing up what can fit together. I think it's useful to interface with some of the new digital options that come up and say, okay, let's see what you have and what fits with us. But it is absolutely essential that this bad boy identity of some of these digital um, systems we don't pay tax, we disrupt. You are disrupting both the formal system and the informal system in ways that mess things up. They don't improve, they don't advance. So if you are bringing in a system, bring, it, bring in your system into the system. And that means it's really important to be integrated into the tax system, into the labor system, into the registration system, into the statistical system. Um, uh, the uh, transport authority in Lagos said that as far as they're concerned, digital taxis, and it's not just Uber, Taxify, Oga Taxi, are statistically invisible. They, uh, they, they can't tell them from private cars. So the statistical system and the Uber statistical system and the public statistical system need to interface. And my understanding is that when the government, both in uh, Abuja and in Lagos, tried to get access to the statistical systems, the data systems of the digital taxi companies, they were highly resistant. So it is true that they have a share data system, but the impression I get is that's not commensurate with public needs, and those things need to be negotiated. Thank you. I was very happy to hear the word people, consumer, passenger, youth, driver. So I think one of the things that's important is that digitization um, is something that happens from below, and this ties into skills and engagement. Um, digital technologies can be used to crowdsource, so people can give you information about public transport or how it's doing, which is what Etiquini is thinking about, that passengers can say the service is good, bad. Um, we know one of the most effective platforms, Waze, uh, is actually all crowdsourced information about traffic conditions. It has its own problems. Mathri Root in Nairobi, it's a community. Kenyans take their community, they put it on digital platforms and they help each other out. They often have vibrant debates. But they'll say, look, don't go down Kenyatta Highway today at this time. There's been a terrible crash. They've even used that data about crashes that Kenyans have report for their ambulance services. Sometimes they get information about sending out an ambulance before you know, the police get to them. So I think what we really need to do is really um, bring 
the digital power and technologies or ensure that citizens, young people, young professionals, the youth that need to be employed have these skills and that we apply them in ways that are smart for improving access, mobility, service, and even our infrastructure in all our cities, including here in Africa. And I just want to acknowledge the Addis Ababa Transport Authority that worked with Addis Ababa University to create digital data about their transport system. And the young computer scientists at Addis Ababa University jumped at the opportunity to support their transport authority. Um, and they learned a lot from that process. So I think this kind of collaboration, this kind of building from the bottom up of indigenous, um, you know, digitization, if you will, for the service of the people is what is really, really important. Thank you, Jackie. So we're slowly coming, unfortunately, to an end, but I, I have a final question, and I hope maybe Justin and Jalisa will be happy to answer this, and uh, then Eleni will uh, close this session. One of the most radical suggestions in your transport strategy was to keep the share of private car use at 15%. That's probably the single most difficult thing to achieve because also the developmental narrative, the inviting of the car industry, of all of this goes directly against it. What we also need to acknowledge is that when we think about then shared system, that it's not so much about you know, whether the car is owned privately or not. Yes, with parking you have an advantage if it's not privately owned, but moving people with one to two tons of steel as individuals is just insane. And my question for Justin, and Julissa, is how do you think your systems, and as we move into autonomous territories, are able to embrace a notion where autonomous driving, but also the broader suite of offers companies like Uber can put to the table, break away from just moving individuals in steel, as I said before. Justin. Yeah, so, so I purposefully uh, focused on the word flexible mobility which allows us to completely uh, incorporate and uh, acknowledge the key role that mass transit is gonna play. And the ability to move people by rail or light rail or bus remains the key way for cities to grow and grow sustainably using the smallest amount of space to do the job. The uh, panacea that we see of technology as the uh, all-encompassing all solution for our transport needs, that we're gonna flick a switch and everything's gonna be autonomous and moving and we won't need traffic lights. I mean, great, welcome to the year 2050. Um, I, I'd like to see that movie too. It's called Blade Runner. Um, <laughs> we're also very concerned. What happens when um, the, a, a foreign state owns that autonomous technology and a foreign state owns the way that your traffic lights coordinate and that foreign state suddenly is not so friendly to you anymore and f flicks a switch and your city grinds to a halt. So the technologies that come out are what, what worries me, very proprietary, very advanced. And just as you saw with, 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 with uh, 2016 and uh, uh, Facebook, we're only starting to understand the social externalities and the social consequences. And I think we're at transport 1.0 was you know, zero technology and the traditional ways of sharing. Transport 2.0 is not ideal, but transport 3.0 represents an opportunity for us to uh, look at the labor question, to look at the need for actual proper information sharing. Uh, a bus that wants a subsidy must give accurate records that it operated. A taxi company that wants to operate in a city must tell you how many vehicles we have on the road, how many drivers, uh, how many trips, where those trips are coming from. Um, the curbside is going to become something that we want to uh, uh, use congestion charging for. And so technology has a role to play, but it has a, a role to play for good. I'm frankly quite embarrassed by my colleagues in the shared mobility technology space. I now almost want to uh, hide when you look at these uh, dockless bikes and scooters that just get dropped down. You know, if I went into a city and dropped down 10,000 tons of steel overnight and said, there you go, scooters, everybody, uh, I'd be in jail. You know, so how is it that we just kind of wrap, a, wrap an app around it and suddenly illegal behaviors are acceptable? Um, I, I think the shared mobility and technology industry has a, a really hard look that it has to do it itself before we look at a transport 3.0. But hopefully flexi flexible mobility will be respectful of uh, urban mobility systems. Thank you. I, I'm a huge proponent of mass transit system myself. I'm also mindful of the developing trends, or emerging trends, rather. I think it's quite important that we ask ourselves the hard question, why is it that in some markets you'll find that companies find it easy to come in and do as they wish as it has been shared around the table? 
it's very important that government becomes the center of those discussions. In other words, you are seeing where, what is happening around the world. Take control of that. Because if you don't, somebody else will. Let's be frank. Justin talks about scooters being dropped. Clearly, there's a demand. And somebody has just put in an app to add the efficiency. Bicycles have always been there. Scooters have always been there. So this is something that doesn't happen in a vacuum. An opportunity is seen and an opportunity is being taken by a company that, or companies that do have the resources and the, and, and, and the know-how. So how do we see this thing unfolding in South Africa? I think there's a huge opportunity in leveraging on technology. For, for me, in two ways, if we can get the private car user who's now decided I don't need to own two cars because of the cost of running a car, we've got e-tolls, urban tolling in South Africa, the petrol hikes have gone up three, four times, it's madness to own a car. So unless you then give them an option, then they'll continue to get stuck in their cars. Ask a private car user what would make you shift and they'll tell you nothing else but convenience. The price is a discussion for another day because you can't compare the price of a taxi to a price of an Uber vehicle. The second thing I want to say is that we would not have done justice to our society unless the same application makes it possible for somebody who's in the remotest rural area of South Africa to be able to access public transport. You can't have people relying on a taxi that comes to drop off people that work at a five-star hotel in the rural KZN and only when it has delivered those employees, then it, is, it makes itself available to a huge community of people that still also need to move for whatever reason. It's insane. So I think collectively, if we can get to that point of using this technology to make public transport accessible and safe for everyone, irrespective of the demographic group they belong to, would have done a great job. So what Dr. Solomon showed us is very, uh, interesting and how do we keep it so when we get to those points then let's have a strategy that really concentrates and focuses on resources that we have particularly less developed countries like Ethiopia where funding where financial resources are uh, very stressed then we need to build gradually and we need to build on what we have and use these different technologies and information that we have appropriately so that we will be able to uh, benefit uh, out of the uh, uh, in t technology that's available. The other is we have a bulging uh, uh, population in Africa. So all sectors, particularly transportation t sector, has to focus on how to create employment. So all these, empl all these technologies that we have shouldn't be at the expense of the employment uh, and job generation that could be uh, uh, available. The other thing I want to uh, focus on is we have been talking about uh, Addis and uh, uh, Lagos, which are the biggest cities in, in, in Africa and in, in Ethiopia in particular. And when do we look at the secondary cities? I was wondering, and uh, 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 it was earlier discussed as well, let's shift our focus to secondary cities before they become very difficult to manage. So we will have this learning opportunity and apply them to guide them efficiently. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. And I'm now going to democratize time pressure. This is your time for the coffee break. Uh, no, let's, let's keep it to uh, 15 minutes. That would be ideal. And see you back here at this table uh, just after noon. Thank you.